Здравствуйте, welcome to day 109 of Russian Through Poems and Paintings. Today we're finally getting uh, into some new material. It's actually a very old topic for us and one of the most important, without question, in, in all of Russian grammar, namely aspect, right? How to choose between imperfective and perfective verbs. And today we're moving beyond what we covered in books one and two, which we refer to in this class as basic aspect, right? So that's a somewhat arbitrary uh, distinction, but uh, when I was writing these books, I felt like the best way to do this was to take at first a rather practical approach that's much simpler and also very effective for most situations, and then later revisit this difficult topic. Now that I hope you at least have some firm idea of what, what aspect is and what the basic distinctions are, and now we're ready to present that in a somewhat more sophisticated way that will allow us to account for a wider range of, of possibilities. Um, so, you know, I just, I like to throw out this number. It's based on absolutely not, nothing, nothing factual, no, no studies or anything. But I think the so-called basic aspect that we studied in books one and two would probably account for maybe 75% of choices of aspect just in everyday speech, right? Around 75% of cases, everything we've learned so far about aspect would help you choose aspect correctly. Now, another important thing about basic aspect is that we presented it in terms of three criteria that were pretty cut and dried, right? We said, for example, that imperfective verbs capture ongoing motion, uh, whereas perfective verbs capture sort of completed motion, right? There's the process versus the, the, the end, the completion, or as we mentioned, sometimes the inception of a process, right? Imperfective verbs can describe repeated action, whereas perfective verbs only can only describe sort of one-time action. And finally, imperfective verbs can describe attempt, right? Again, we can understand it's an attempt as a process, right? You're in the process of writing a book or whatever. You could also think of that as, again, an attempt. And then a perfective verb could be used to describe the completion of that attempt, namely the, uh, the success, right? And so from, from those criteria, we got uh, what were basically rules, right? So for example, if you're, if you're describing ongoing action, it would be simply wrong to use a perfective verb, right? Just flat out incorrect, uh, if not grammatically, then at least logically, right? By the same token, if you're describing repeated action, you've got to use imperfective. There's really no uh, no way about, no two ways about it, right? So we sort of had right versus wrong, right? It was sort of cut and dried in that respect. Um, okay, so now that we're moving into advanced aspect, we're going to see that um, it's not always quite so simple, right? It's not just a matter of right versus wrong or sort of absolutes, it's more a matter of relativity. And sometimes I joke that basic aspect is like Newtonian physics and advanced aspect is like, you know, the theory of relativity, right? Because everything's relative. And so um, an important thing to keep in mind is that for aspect generally, especially these special cases that we're uh, considering under the guise of advanced aspect, um, everything's relative. So it's only a matter uh, not of right and wrong, but of rather what the, what the speaker chooses to emphasize within a given context, right? So everything is context driven. And then within that context, it's simply a matter of what you're choosing to emphasize, right? And so we can only judge a statement as right or wrong, depending on whether or not what you mean to say is what you're actually saying, right? Whether or not your choice of aspect is conveying what you really mean to say within the context, um, right? Based on what we're, the, the, uh, the guidelines we're going to give today. Um, but, right, there's no, in a lot of these examples, there won't be a right or wrong answer in terms of grammar, right? Either aspect would be perfectly acceptable grammatically, right? It's just there's going to be a different emphasis, a different uh, idea conveyed, depending on your choice of aspect. Okay, so uh, I may have mentioned this a few days ago, but I think it's always worth re re revisiting a couple of very simple points that I think sometimes are so obvious they may kind of escape attention, right? Um, number one, uh, if you, if a verb comes in an aspectual pair, and most verbs in Russian do, they come in pairs, uh, for example, to to write, right? Pisat na pisat. Every time you talk about writing using a verb in Russian, you have to choose aspect, right? It is an either or proposition, right? So just a very basic logical uh, point to be made here, right? Is there is an either or choice to be made. It is absolutely inevitable, right? And so every time a Russian speaker talks about writing, they, they're going to have to choose. And they, I guess also quite logically, they always do that based on something, right? There's always some reason why they're choosing one aspect over another. 
right? So uh, that may be obvious, I hope it is, but it's always worth bearing in mind. Maybe more interestingly, and this is actually quite interesting, I think we'll, we'll get a better sense of this today. Um, one thing I remember hearing, if not from professors, at least from other students or people learning Russian back in the day, um, you know, you'll hear things like, oh, well, you know, well, first of all, aspect is very difficult. That's true. But then often you slip into saying things like, well, choice of aspect in Russian is very subtle, right? It's based on all these subtleties. It's very kind of slippery. It's vague. It's subtle. No, it is not, right? It is not subtle at all. And that's really an important point, I think, to realize, right? And we're going to see that today, right? That but based on choice of aspect, when a Russian hears an utterance, the Russian hearer is immediately picking up on what aspect is being used. And all sorts of communication is being, information is being communicated through that choice of aspect. And it is absolutely crystal clear uh, within the context precisely what the, the, those distinctions are that are being made, right? So this is not some kind of mystery to a Russian speaker. We should never imagine that a Russian speaker is sitting there analyzing, you know, kind of the way we, we're forced to do it first based on criteria or whatever, like what subtleties are being kind of uh, vaguely uh, uh, groped after in this utterance. No, it's not like that at all, right? Um, and so what you'll notice is that if you are misusing um, aspect, again, within a certain context in which, you know, in a given context, all the stakes are perfectly clear to everyone involved, right? They know, you know, especially again, native speakers, they know what's going on. And if you say something that doesn't make much sense aspectually, they'll immediately pick up on it, right? They'll, and they'll, they may sort of accuse you, like, what, what, what are you talking about? Because there's this disconnect between the context and what you, what just came out of your mouth, right? Uh, so again, this is based on, on years of experience, experience, uh, years of suffering, uh, you know, which, you know, when I would make mistakes with aspect, and again, it took me years, maybe a decade to really feel like I understood aspect well. And that led me to develop the way I, I presented in these books, right, which I, you know, I haven't seen anything quite like this elsewhere. It's really, I, I'd like to think it's my own invention. Uh, and as far as I can tell, I think it accounts for pretty much every uh, aspectual situation you could think of. I, you know, as I go through and read novels and whatnot and hear people talk, you know, my, my radar is always sort of on alert for situations that I feel like I haven't accounted for in this presentation. And I, you know, I really have yet to find one. Um, maybe I'm overlooking something, but if, if I am, then I think it's, it's, it's really a very, very special, unusual situation. Okay, so, and why is that? Well, because the, the way we're looking at aspect now today is very flexible. It's very elastic, right? It, it doesn't boil down to just a set of three rules, right? Because aspect is too, uh, again, it's not subtle, but it's too, it's too rich, it's too complex for that sort of reductionism, right? Okay, so I guess enough prelude. Um, let's see. So, Let's first look at a, a painting, right? This is Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy в кабинете под сводами. This is him writing in his, it's basically a basement um, down in the, the lower, well, obviously the basement, the lower floor of his house in Yasnya Polyana. And he liked to work there in the summers, when, it, uh, if I remember when it was, um, well, to get away from noise and just have sort of peace and quiet, even though his office was, was uh, upstairs, he liked to work down here. And uh, if memory serves, I think that's where he wrote a lot of War and Peace. But at any rate, he, he liked to write here. Um, okay, so uh, let's let's ask a, a simple question. Who wrote War and Peace, right? Trivia, who wrote War and Peace? Well, how would we ask that question in, in Russian? Well, I think if a student were asked that, having gone through first year Russian or books one and two of this uh, series, they'd probably say, Кто написал войну и мир? Right, кто написал? Remember the period is Pisaj na Pisaj. Okay, why would they choose na Pisaj? Um, well, first of all, I should maybe say that that's probably wrong, right? That's that's That doesn't sound right. But why would students very forgivably make this mistake? Well, because they think, you know, we've been told that perfective aspect describes completed actions, right? And so obviously Tolstoy finished writing War and Peace, right? So they tend to think, well, it's na Pisaj. Okay, and this is sort of the point that I like to use to you as a sort of springboard into advanced aspect, right? Into a way of thinking about aspect that's a little bit more uh, sophisticated. 
right? And that is the, the sort of key word we'll be using over and over again today, vabshia. Vabshia, you may have heard that word already. It's just a little adverb. And it's, it's best translated as generally speaking or in general, right? It sort of lays out this kind of categorical uh, context, right? Where all we're asking about is th sort of a bare fact, right? Has something ever happened? Uh, we're asking just about the, the fact of the activity at all, right? Without any focus on completion, right? So this may strike you as somewhat counterintuitive, again, based on what you've been told so far. We've been using a rather simplified uh, lens through which we, we're reviewing aspect, right? If we ask the question, who wrote War and Peace? That's sort of a vibe shia question, right? All we're concerned about is who was the author of War and Peace, not who sat there and finished writing War and Peace. Um, you know, this is maybe somewhat uh, of a stretch, but it's almost like asking in English instead of who wrote War and Peace, who finished writing War and Peace or who completely wrote War and Peace? OK, that strikes any English hearer, listener as just kind of a bizarre question. It's not really wrong, but it's just a little bit off. It seems like the, the emphasis is sort of misplaced, right? OK, so the, the way you would normally ask that question is, right? Of course, there are other ways to ask that. You could ask, after, uh, right, or whatever. But, um, because all we're asking about is the bare fact of who wrote the novel, right? Now, um, in another context, right, if we were focusing on the actual completion of the novel, right, the act of completing it versus just the bare fact of having written it, uh, at all, then of course we could use napisat. There's nothing grammatically wrong with saying kto napisal raman, right? Who wrote the novel, right? But it would require some kind of a different context. Okay, so let's move on from that and, and talk instead of about writing War and Peace, which is a little bit of an unusual situation. Let's take something uh, more ordinary and talk about reading War and Peace. And this is a nice example because we everyone knows the pair chitat pro chitat by this point, right? So it's an easy pair to work with. And uh, it, it's also nice because Vaina um, Emir is not something easily read. You don't just sit down and read it, right? It often requires some kind of effort, right? So um, it's easy to touch on all the different um, sort of flavors of aspectual choice with this example of have you read War and Peace? Or just talking about reading War and Peace. Okay, so here's here's the best example that I know of, or that I always use for transitioning to advanced aspect, right? Let's say you walk up to, you're in Moscow, you walk up to some a total stranger on the street, and you want to ask them, have you read War and Peace? Okay, so we're back to the same question. As a student, so far, based on what you know, what aspect would you use to, to ask that question? Well, probably, up till today at least, you would have said, Again, perfective, right? Because again, the idea is we're asking the person whether or not they've read War and Peace. That's a, if they've read it, that's a past tense action. And so we write only perfective verbs describe completed actions, right? So why not choose prochitat? Right? Okay, so let's let's run with that, right? And let's ask this stranger, we prochitali vainui mir. Okay, again, aspectual choice is not subtle to native speakers. Why would the stranger look at you like you just fallen from the moon, right? He would give you a look, right? And uh, so again, he wouldn't have to think about it. He wouldn't have to sort of mull over all the subtleties. He'd just be like, what kind of a question is that, right? Why Why would that question elicit that response? Well, let's think about vabshia, right? Again, that's kind of the key word today for so many of these examples. <clears throat> if we want to ask a vabshia question, we ask using perfective verbs. And this is a vabshia question, right? Has, has this person read War and Peace, period, at all, ever? Has he ever read War and Peace? That's the, the question, the point of the question. Okay, so that's a vabshia question in Russian. And as we'll see today, if we could logically insert this word vabshia and have it make sense, it's not that we always have to insert it, but if we could write this in general idea and it would make sense within the, the utterance, then we should probably choose imperfective. And that's what we should ask here, right? Okay, because again, that's the first question, especially if we're asking a stranger. We don't know anything about this person. So the only kind of question we can really ask of him 
um, about his life is a, is a kind of Vabshia question. Um, okay, and it's only based on knowing whether or not he's read War and Peace Vabshia, right, at all, generally speaking. It's only on the basis of that knowledge that we could then go on and ask a more specific question about whether he read it completely, right? So it, it's as if in, in, in jumping straight out with the perfective question, we've jumped the gun, right? We've made this unwarranted assumption that he's ever read War and Peace. It also kind of insinuates that we sort of know this person and we, we have some knowledge that he has ever read War and Peace. And now we're asking him this very bizarre specific question, have you completed War and Peace? Okay, so it's just kind of a weird question. Uh, but, uh, you know, again, we always have to stop ourselves today. Is it incorrect to ask if we precitali vai nui mir? No, it's not incorrect. It's certainly not grammatically incorrect. But again, it's almost on a, this kind of social level, it seems abrupt, right? It, we've, we've jumped the gun and we're asking out of the clear blue sky, have you ever finished War and Peace? Right? Uh, okay, so anyway, let's stick with the normal question, which would be, which itale vai nui mir? Okay, the guy would answer that question, which is imperfective. He would typically follow that up with an imperfective answer, right? So, so many times in Russian, the answer will mirror the question grammatically, right? It's just sort of reflecting, repeating the question and then inserting the answer using the same grammar. So he'd say either da chital or niet nichital, right? That's a vavshia yes and no question. Okay, and then based on that response, we could ask ask a follow-up question, which is now perfectly logical. Uh, if he says, da, chital, chital, and you'd say, uh, aprochitali, right? There's the follow-up question, starting with, ah, aprochitali, did you finish reading it? Right, so I know you read it at all. Now I'm interested, did you actually finish it, right? Okay, and then he can answer that follow-up question again with the perfective. That's now a perfective question asking specifically about result, about completion. And he'd say, da prochital or niet ni prochital, right? Okay, so uh, that's a really good example. And today, by the way, before we introduce this sort of systematically, we're going to look at several of these examples and sort of get the wheels spinning in terms of thinking about aspect. Uh, Here's an example from uh, from real life. Some of these are kind of um, uh, thinly fictionalized examples from, from real life, right? So uh, some friend was uh, throwing a party, just a little get-together to watch soccer or something. And I said something like, uh, well, did you invite so-and-so? Uh, so let's look at this example. Tibur uh, Priglasio. And I get a response, and... Uh, well, let's first of all look at the question. What aspect is that? Well, the pair here is priglashait uh, priglasit to invite. Priglashait priglasit. So I went up to my friend and asked this question: Did you invite so and so? Right? Tiboru priglasil. Did you invite Borya? Okay. What aspect did I ask with perfective? Right? Priglasit is perfective. Okay. Is that just completely incorrect in this context? No, not necessarily, because I, this is my friend. I obviously know what's going on. There's a party being planned. I know people are being invited, that kind of thing, right? So I'm sort of entitled to ask uh, perfective questions about what I expect is going to happen, right? In terms of sort of result, completion, right? Following through with things. Okay, now the friend, instead of responding with a perfective answer, he responds with an imperfective, right? He says, Niet yaivu nyeprigla shal. And again, we could throw in a vibshia there. Yayivo vibshia ni priglashal. Yayivo ni priglashal vibshia. Okay, what's happened here? Well, when I asked the perfective question, I was kind of, uh, again, not subtly, but certainly sort of, uh, you know, between the lines, so to speak, I was implying an assumption, right? I was assuming that he wanted to invite Borya, that he intended to invite Borya vibshia, right? generally speaking, at all, in the first place, right? But it, he made clear in the response that I was unjustified in that assumption, right? And he says, no, not only did I not go and invite him in terms of actually mailing off the invitation or calling him or sending the email, I didn't invite him at all. I had no intention in the first place of inviting him. Yaivo nepriglashal, right? So again, you see how uh, by choice of aspect, often... 
there's a sort of assumption baked into it, right? Whether or not something uh, was supposed to happen, whether or not someone wanted something to happen, whether they were supposed to do it, right? All of this sort of vabshya stuff. And then if we, we jump past that assumption in order to ask perfective questions about it, well, I know, I assume you wanted to do it, or I believe that you were supposed to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And now I'm asking, well, did you actually go and do it? Perfective. But if that assumption was incorrect, uh, you can overturn it by responding with an imperfective. Okay, here's one more uh, fun example. Uh, I thought of this watching a movie. Um, uh, again, it's just sort of, you know, you're studying Russian for years and years and you have a, a general awareness of, 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 of anything, not, not only aspect, but other things in Russian. And it's these concrete examples that sort of, um, you know, a light bulb goes off and you're like, oh, okay, this is a really good example. I really feel like I understand it better now than I did before. Okay, so it's some, it's some, uh, it's this movie about a kind of police investigation. This guy has been unjustly accused of killing his wife. Um, okay, so let's, let's, what's he going to tell the investigator? Or actually, we can imagine him in court, right? Uh, what's he going to tell the judge, the jury, about killing his wife? Uh, and let's use the pair ubivat ubit to kill ubivat ubit to kill to murder. Okay, again, up until now, you probably would guess perfective, right? Because again, the wife has been murdered apparently, and the issue is who killed her, right? That's a completed action, and so why not use the perfective? Okay, so the guy says in court, he's like yanubil, and gasps are heard throughout the courtroom. Right. The jury is they're They're muttering. They're looking at each other. The judge is, you know, all disturbed. OK, why? So, again, an example of aspect not being very subtle. Right. Why would that uh, elicit such a bizarre response? Because by using the perfective, it's sort of implicitly allowing the assumption to stand. Right. Which is something like. I intended to kill my wife. I wanted to kill my wife. Uh, maybe even I went about killing my wife. I, I was planning the murder. I was trying to hire a hitman, whatever it was, right? But for whatever reason, in the end, I personally didn't go through and murder my wife. Okay, so it's, it sounds like a very bizarre kind of defense strategy, right? Um, and what you're sort of admitting wanting to do it without actually doing it. By the way, it reminds me of uh, the Brothers Karamazov. That's sort of the crux of the whole um, ethical dilemma there is Ivan Karamazov didn't actually kill his father, but he thought about it a lot. And in his heart of hearts, he probably wanted his father to be killed, right? So the issue is not did he obese, right? But did he want, did he sort of want his father to be murdered? Vabshia, right? So anyway, think you might keep that distinction in mind when you read um, the Brothers Karamazov. Okay, so the correct utterance in the courtroom would probably be Yanyu Bival, Yanyu Bival, Yanyu Bival, right? Because that's a Vabshia statement. I had nothing to do with it. I, I had, I loved my wife. I had no, right? I had absolutely, my hands are completely clean of this murder, right? Okay, let's take a more kind of innocent everyday example. Our pin is missing, right? We're in class and, uh, you know, we've got two neighbors on either side of us. Our pin is missing, our beloved pen. And we're like, so we're going to ask about that using perfective, right? Because the pin is gone. The result of this action is still in place. The pin is gone. That's a perfective situation. So we ask, Kto vzjal maju ručku? Kto vzjal maju ručku? Okay, and again, someone, our neighbor next to us says, Right, using, again, the perfective. Okay, so that's kind of weird, right? So did you mean to take it? Did you try to take it? Did you want to take it? Did you see who actually took it? And you, you're not, you're choosing not to tell me. And for whatever kind of fishy reason, you're responding with this perfective, right? Which, again, sort of is is keeping in place this assumption of a vibe shia, Right? Uh, so basically, if you're innocent, the more appropriate response is "ya yivu nibral," right? I had not, I didn't touch. It's kind of like an English saying, "I didn't touch your pen." I don't know what you're talking about. I had, I didn't want to take your pen. I didn't try to take it. I have nothing to do with your pen. Another way, in kind of colloquial um, 
English that, that's often nice is I wasn't about to do something like I'm not about to t take your pen. I wasn't about to take your pen, right? I, am, I had no desire to take your pen. Okay, one last example. Let's say you have another classmate and you know she's really d diligent. She always does her homework. Um, uh, and you want to ask her, let's say you were supposed to read an article for class and it's right before class and you ask her, uh, tell us that you. Okay, why would she be offended possibly? Because we've just asked her a Vabshia question, right? Now knowing, again, we have context in place here, right? This isn't just out of the blue. We have some context. We know this person. We've been in class together. We know she does her work. We know she's a great student. And so it's kind of weird knowing what we know about her to ask her, did you read the article at all? Right, especially since we know it was assigned, right? So here it's not really a matter of intent only, but also what you were supposed to do, right? There is this assumption that you were supposed to read it. That's kind of a vabshia thing, right? And so the, the question we would ask is, well, did you, we know it was assigned to read it. We know being a good student, you probably wanted to read it. So my only question for you is, were you able to actually get it read the way I expect you probably did? Right, so we would normally ask, uh, right? did you go and read the article the way you were supposed to, the way I expect you you, you wanted to and did? Um, okay, so again, if we ask the Vabshia question, she might be sort of taken aback, like, well, of course, of course I read it. I always do my work, right? Now, again, this is a problem we're going to see again and again today. It's kind of hard to write exercises for this because again, it's it's so context driven. So unless I give you like a little mini paragraph, getting all this context in place, uh, you can often sort of think of any number of scenarios that would shift our, our likely choice of aspect, right? So let's say something like the article was boring and everyone knew it. It's this long, horrible article. Everyone was just groaning about it when it was assigned. Okay, in that case, we might assume that even a good student who reads everything would not, would reasonably not go and read that article, right? And so again, if this kind of vibe question is floating in the air, we would likely choose imperfective, right? Like, hey, did you read that boring article or not, right? You know, the sort of or not question hanging in the air, right? It's it's like, did you read it or did you not read it? That's a completely open-ended vibe question. Um, okay, so... That does it for the early examples, right? Hopefully you've already, you're already thinking about aspect in a slightly more sophisticated way. Again, we've seen so far that the sort of the takeaway today, the one keyword that'll really help think about this is vibshia, right? Okay, so based on what we said so far, let's look at um, uh, some examples. And uh, again, just sentence by sentence, we don't have a lot of context. Let's just choose the most likely uh, scenario based on what little we know here. Okay, uh, did you watch the movie? Okay, sometimes clues can be rather, uh, again, I, I don't want to say subtle, but rather seemingly innocuous, right? Here we have a definite article, the movie. Okay, even that little definite article makes gives us an idea that there's some context here. There was some movie that we've talked about before, it seems like there's some assumption that we, we might watch it and so or maybe we were supposed to watch it. And so this is probably going to call for a perfective uh, question, right? The postmatrial film, right? Did you watch the movie? Hey, that movie, did you did you go and watch it the way we talked about or whatever? Okay, now compare that with number two, ever, right? So watch for little keywords. That ever is kind of like the Russian vibe shia, right? Have you ever watched this movie? Now note how that, again, is a completely open-ended question. Have you ever watched this movie? Uh, ты смотрел этот фильм? Right? Ты смотрел этот фильм? Speaking to a guy. Okay, number three. Have you tried caviar? Okay, again, that sounds like an, a completely open-ended question. Have you tried caviar ever or not? That's a вообще question. That's imperfective. Ты пробовала икру? Right? Speaking to a female. Ты пробовала икру? Okay, number four, hey, you should go try that caviar, right? Okay, now, again, even the, the caviar or that caviar, that's all by itself giving us a sense of context, right? Maybe we're at a, a you know, a, a snack bar or whatever. Hey, you should try the caviar. That's perfective. Ты должен попробовать икру. Ты должен попробовать икру. 
Okay, so there we have a matter of context, right? This Vabshya context, this categorical, very broad, universal kind of context versus, hey, that caviar over there, you should go try it. Okay, number five, you promised to meet me at the airport. Okay, let's think here also about context. We're going to talk about that more in a moment. A rather narrow context. Hey, you, you promised, you made the specific promise to meet me at the airport. It sounds like on this on this one specific occasion. Okay, now let's think. Is this a vabshia question? Not really, because we have intent and this feel, this sense of what you were supposed to do, right? You made a promise. That told me you meant to do it, you were supposed to do it, you promised to do it. And so the, the promise is to go and actually meet me at the airport, perfected, right? Ты пообещал встретить меня в аэропорту. Ты пообещал, right? Hey, you made a promise. You made that promise to me specifically. Okay, now we come back. I didn't promise anything, right? Okay, someone's got a memory loss problem here, right? I didn't promise anything. Okay, note how he or she is, wa they're washing their hands of the situation Я ничего не обещал. Я не обещал ничего. And you see how, again, with the imperfective, they're bucking this kind of assumption that you did make this promise, right? No, I didn't promise anything. Я ничего не обещал. Okay, number seven. Why did you turn on my computer? Okay, again, the computer's on. The result is in place of this action. That's a perfective action. Почему ты включил мою компьютер? Мой, sorry, мой компьютер. Почему ты включил мой компьютер? Okay, number eight, again, kind of the same thing. I didn't turn on your computer. I wasn't. I didn't touch your computer. I wasn't about to turn on your computer. That's an imperfective statement bucking this assumption or this insinuation that I touched your computer. Я не включал твой компьютер. Я не включал вообще. Right, again, you can throw in the вообще. It would make, be right at home there. Okay, number nine, I haven't tried to call him. Okay, now, uh, this, you know, again, we could discuss some of these uh, quite a bit, right? Now, it sounds like we're, we have some kind of context that, you know, maybe I was supposed to call someone or whatever, but I'm saying, well, so far I haven't done it. I haven't, it's not, not, not only have I not gone and, and made the call, I haven't even gone about it vabshia, right? Ya yimu nezvanil. Я ему, remember that takes the dative, я ему не звонил, вообще. Okay, so let's say, let's follow that up and say, I'm going to call him tomorrow. I haven't called him at all. I haven't even tried to call him, much less called him successfully. I'll go and do it tomorrow, right? No problem, no big deal. Я ему позвонил завтра. Now, back in basic aspects, we did this in terms of three criteria, right? Uh, ongoing versus completion repeated versus one time, and effort versus success. Okay, we can sort of keep those three uh, ideas kind of more or less. And again, we can continue to use them. They're very useful in, in the majority of situations. But we need to keep in mind some other considerations that will be a little bit more flexible in allowing us to um, accommodate this, this range of choice, right? this range of freedom that the speaker has to emphasize what they want to emphasize within a sort of a rich context. Okay, so the number, the first, and I like to call these not criteria, but spectra, right? You have this uh, three different spectra, right? One spectrum, two spectra, right? So it's sort of a sliding kind of, of, of situation based on what we're choosing to emphasize. Okay, the first consideration is context. And this is a really, really useful one. The broader the context, the more likely you are to choose imperfective, right? If you're talking about, for example, what I was doing last year or even um, all of yesterday, right? We have sort of a broad context versus, for example, um, what, um, let's say we have some specific context, like what happened yesterday at five o'clock or what happened yesterday at the party or during class, right? Uh, the more narrow the context, the more likely we are to get uh, perfective. Now we can think about that in terms today of the vabshia, right? If you can insert a vabshia, then the context is pretty much as broad as it can possibly get. It's sort of this categorical universal context. We're, we're thinking about whether something happened at all, right? With no focus on completion, right? Now, by the way, I, I think I forgot to mention earlier, 
that one point uh, to be made, made about this reading War and Peace, if someone tells us, Da uh, yachital uh, did he finish it or not? We have no idea, right? We, we have no idea because all that the imperfective is getting across is the vibe shia, right? That something happened at all, right? It's not really saying anything about completion or success, right? So we can't sort of guess either way based on an imperfective verb whether or not something was completed. To really make that clear, we would have to ask a perfective question or hear a perfective statement, right? Uh, so anyway, uh, imperfective is the vibe shia. That's just the bare fact of whether something has happened at all. And then the, the very, broad, a very broad context versus a more specific context where uh, we may be focused on the completion, right? This one time, well, did you go and do something? Uh, uh, did you complete it? Uh, did you complete this specific task as opposed to having done it ever at any time? Okay, so context. Number two is intent, and we've talked about this already, right? Imperfective verbs establish intent. They establish a vibe share in the sense that I wanted to do something. I was supposed to do something. I meant to do something in the first place at all, whatsoever, right? All of those vibe share ideas. Okay, whereas a perfective verb, as we saw, it assumes the intent. It sort of leapfrogs this question of intent. It assumes uh, intent or obligation. And then against that backdrop, it goes on to ask, well, did you go and do it? Did you actually get it done the way you wanted to, the way you were supposed to, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so it's very, again, result-oriented, uh, result-focused. Okay, finally, number three, you know, think back to the criterion basic aspect. We, we mentioned how those that third criterion doesn't isn't always very important, right? Uh, attempt versus success, right? Sometimes it's very useful, but it, often it just doesn't really, it's not really the point. Okay, so this third example here in advanced aspect is also somewhat unusual. But uh, when it does happen, it can fully account for choice of aspect. Um, let's start here um, uh, with, with that last example we, we looked at in terms of giving someone a, a phone call, right? Um, what if, if we say something like, I'm going to go call my friend, usually there's no idea, there's no sense of effort implied there, right? I'm just going to go and do it, right? That's a very much perfect, a perfective type of action. I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go and do that. Just kind of every day, do this, do that type of situations where there's no implication that it's going to be some type of a long process or it's going to require a bunch of effort. Okay, but by the same token, if a Russian, for no other apparent reason, uses an imperfective verb, it may be to just imply this idea that this is going to take a while, right? It's not just, I'm going to go and do it. It's sort of like in English when we say, oh, I've got to sit down and go about writing this paper or whatever, right? It's not just like firing off an email. It's like, oh, I've got to sit down. And as with all imperfective verbs, we're sort of imagining seeing someone at work on it, right? Not just, you know, bam, off goes the email, but, oh, God, I'm I'm toiling over this paper or whatever, right? That's besides uh, imperfective versus simply not besides, just sort of firing off a written email or whatever. Okay, let's look at a few examples here to make this uh, clearer. Number one, context. Он все время делал ошибки versus он сделал ошибку вчера на экзамене. Okay, look at the context. The first one is is very broad. Все время is a kind of red flag there. Versus yesterday on the exam. Okay, very specific, and he made a mistake. Okay, so that narrow context would usually call for perfective. Okay, number two, intent. Я не буду читать войну и мир. Okay, there's a little different take on it. That's future tense. And that gets across the idea of not only am I not going to finish War and Peace, I have no intention of reading it whatsoever, right? Я не буду читать войну и мир. That's sort of an absolute statement of non-intent or intent, right, based uh, with regard to the future. Versus, я не прочитаю войну и мир, right? Now, again, that's leaving in place the idea that you are going to try to read it or you intend to, to, to at least go about reading it, but you're not going to completely read it. Uh, next example, here's a good one. Tizon, brawl. Did you take the umbrella at all? 
versus Tuizont Xiao. Okay, um, when would we ask the perfective question? Well, if we were expecting someone to take the umbrella, maybe we told them to do it. Maybe we know they always take the umbrella, right? Rain or shine. Maybe we both know that the weather was going to be bad and that we assume that the person meant to take the umbrella, right? So the only question we would ask there is, well, did you go and take the umbrella? Did you, did you remember to actually grab the umbrella the way I know you meant to do, right? Versus, again, the Vabshia question. That would be, did you take the umbrella at all? Right? Maybe you're heading out and it's sunny and there's really no implied expectation that you should take the umbrella. Okay, so we would ask an imperfective question. Okay, finally, effort. Okay, here let's use a, a, a pair I don't think we've seen. Da piece of it, da besides. Right? That means to finish writing. But again, we have a derived imperfective. Da piece of it, that means to be in the process of finishing writing. And to besides meaning simply to complete write, the writing process. Okay, so uh, let's say if we wanted to, uh, in Russian, say, I need, to, I need to finish writing this paper or this letter or whatever. Well, if you choose a perfect, if you say, that has no implied effort, right? It's just, I'm going to go and do it. But if we go, and that would be sort of the ordinary thing to say usually. But if for whatever reason we need to imply that, oh, I've got to go about this drudgery of writing out the letter, we could switch to imperfective to get that idea across, right? Мне надо дописывать письмо. In English, we often say things like, I've got to sit and write this letter, right? I've got to sit here and write this letter, right? And that kind of gets across this idea of this protracted activity, right? Okay, so that does it for a kind of a way to think systematically about advanced aspect. Okay, so let's look at some examples. And again, always keep in mind, uh, be, be patient with the, the examples because as I mentioned, it's hard to write for this topic because again, it's so context driven. You know, the more context we had, the, the clearer our likely answer would be. Um, so let's look at these and not try to make any, any outlandish, you know, uh, cook up some sort of outlandish scenario, but just think what is the most likely thing we would say here given what little we know. Okay, and again, also compare the different uh, takes on the same example, like buying a car, right? We decided to shop for a car. Okay, you may not have thought about this, but shopping is really, what is that? But the attempt to buy, right? The process of buying, right? Not the actual buying, but the going about it, right? That's imperfective, right? So that's effort, right? Or attempt, right? Мы решили покупать машину. Right? Мы решили покупать машину. Versus number two, we decided to go buy a car. Мы решили купить машину. Okay, now contrast those two. That's what we just talked about, right? Just this idea of, well, we're going to go buy a car, right? With no real implication of a process, right? Just simply kind of going and doing it, right? The focus being on the result, not on the attempt, not on the process. Versus this implication that, well, this is going to take some time and effort, right? And again, in English, we, we communicate that difference really by ch the choice of verb between buying and shopping, right? Okay, number three, we were in the process of buying a car. Okay, uh, well, that's pretty obvious. Right? Versus simply, right? Remember, that would be English perfect, uh, simple past tense probably, right? Simply, we bought a car versus... We were in the process of buying a car, or simply, we were buying a car. Okay, number four. Hey, let's buy a car and drive to Finland. Okay, no effort seemingly implied there. And also, we have a process, right? So, давайте купим машину и поедем в Финляндию. Right? Let's buy a car, and off we go. Okay, объяснять, объяснить, to explain. Okay, I spent an hour trying to explain this to them. Okay, the, uh, we have to be careful here, right? We're tr not translating word for word by any means, but how would, how would we say that for an hour I was trying to explain this to them? That's the basic idea. Well, for an hour, remember, is chas, chas, right? For an hour, accusative of time. Ya chas sorry, abisnyal, abisnyal at the im. Ya et im tseli chas abisnyal. Right, I, I spent a whole hour 
trying to explain this to them, right? In the process of explaining. Okay, that's clearly imperfected. Number six, but in the end, I'm not sure I explained anything. Okay, it sounds like the point there is the success, right? I spent an hour trying to explain, but I'm not sure I really got anything across. Da, в конце концов, right in the in the end of ends, literally meaning, right in the end, я ничего не объяснил. Let's just put it that way. I didn't I didn't get anything explained. Or again, to translate more fully, я не знаю, объяснил ли я что-нибудь или нет. Right? Now, by the way, in the exercise, we're really just asking for the form of the verb, right? So we don't necessarily need to give a full translation, but just rather think about what aspect we would use in order to get across the gist of the English. Okay, here it would be объяснить. Number seven, why even try explaining in the first place? Okay, that in the first place, that's a vibshia type. Uh, expression, right? Vibshia, that's imperfective, right? Зачем объяснять would be a good Russian sentence, right? Well, why even try to explain in the first place at all? Number eight, you won't get any anything explained anyway. Ты ничего, ты все равно ничего не объяснишь, right? Ничего не объяснишь, perfective. You will not explain anything successfully. Number nine, the student has to paint a portrait. Okay, now again, without any further context, that sounds like something that they're just going to go and do. They've got to go and do it. They've got to complete it for class. It just sounds like a, a perfective verb, right? Student nada narisavat portrait. Now, you know, again, th there are often different ways you could think about this. If this is an assignment for an art class or something, well, the assignment is not to go about painting a portrait, it's to paint a portrait, right? You've got to turn, you've got to show the end result, right? So again, everything here is pointing to you perfective. Now, what if the student then says, I've got to work on painting this portrait, right? I can't go to the movies tonight. I've got to sit around painting this portrait. That would be imperfective, right? Effort, uh, right? Мне надо писать этот портрет, right? Um, now, again, note how uh, how really it's up to the speaker there to say, well, am I going to sit around working on this portrait or am I going to go and just whip it out really quickly, right? That's up to the speaker to decide, right? So either aspect would be correct here, but the emphasis would be different. Okay, number seven, uh, sorry, number 11, I'll draw you a cat. Okay, sounds like a, a no big whoop to sit down and draw a, t a cat. Я не рисую тебе кошку. Я не рисую кошку, right? Не рисовать. Number 12, I used to love to paint portraits. Okay, that's a good one for context, right? I used to love to paint portraits. We have multiple portraits. This is a used to statement. It sounds like imperfective, right? Я любил рисовать портреты. Number 13, we should find out his number. Okay, sounds like no big whoop, right? Let's just go and find out his number, right? It's not a government secret, right? Надо узнать его телефон. Надо узнать его телефон. Number 14, okay, I'll do it, right? No big whoop, I'll just go and do it. That's perfective. Хорошо, узнаю. Хорошо, узнаю. Perfective. Okay, number 15, well, did you find out like you said you would? Okay, now this is kind of like a mini dialogue, right? Well, Okay, here we're assuming the vibe share. I know you were supposed to do it. You were you wanted to do it. You said you were going to do it. Well, okay, so based on all that, the only logical question is, well, did you go and do it? The was no, right? It was no. That could be a one word question. It was no. Okay, number 16. Well, he bucks that. He says, I didn't even try. I was busy. Okay, so here it's not that the assumption was really incorrect. We know that he wanted to do it. He meant to do it, but now he's saying, well, it turns out I wasn't able to do it like I planned. And not only did I not get it done, I didn't even try to do it, right? Ya news novel. Okay, this is another example, sort of autobiographical. I remember this kind of thing coming up. People would say, well, ya news novel. I didn't even ask, is, is maybe what we say in English, right? I don't know. I didn't even ask about it at all, right? Ya news novel. Okay, and we could think of that in terms of... Uh, Attempt, right? I didn't even attempt to find out about it. I was busy. Okay, that's almost, that's really the end of today's lesson for in terms of just 
treatment of advanced aspect. And I have to say, again, there's really nothing else to add as far as I can tell. Again, every, whenever I'm reading Russian, I'm, I'm, on the, I'm on the hunt for something that can be accounted for using this, this approach. I don't think there's anything out there except for the exceptions. Okay, so let's quickly cover two things that could be thought of as exceptions in the sense that they can't maybe necessarily be thought of clearly in these terms. The, the big one is imperfective of canceled action. Okay, and this doesn't come up every day, but it's, again, if you really want to master aspect, you really need to have this on your radar because, again, I've had contexts where I've chosen wrongly because I didn't take this into account, and people are like, what? Are you crazy, right? Uh, okay, so uh, I'll tell you one little story in a moment. Okay, I was taking an example. Uh, we, we walk in into the classroom. It's in the middle of winter. It's freezing cold in the room, okay? And uh, the issue is, well, probably someone left the window open. Okay, now what if the window is open? What are we going to ask? That's pretty clear, actually. That's perfective. We, we've seen that already today. If the result is still in place, then we would usually use a perfective action to say, well, who did that, right? With the emphasis on completion and so forth. Кто открыл окно? Кто открыл окно? But what if the window is closed, right? Now it's freezing cold in the room. It's clear that the window has been open. But now it's it's closed, right? So uh, in this situation, if we ask the perfective question, it's going to be off, right? Because the the result has been canceled, right? So I think the first step here in grasping this is just to realize why using a perfective wouldn't really make sense anymore. Well, in this situation, we use what we call the imperfective of canceled action, right? We would say, Кто открывал окно? Meaning something like, who opened and closed the window again? Who opened it and closed it again, right? Кто открывал? That's a very special use of the imperfective. Here's another one that comes up quite often, right? What if your friend visited last year and you say something like, well, you know, back back last summer or whatever, my friend came to visit. And you say, Мой друг приехал. Why might that sound odd? Well, is your friend still there, right? So all you're saying is, well, he, he, he arrived, he came to visit, but you're not canceling the action, right? So again, if the action has been undone, then you would go to the imperfective of canceled action and say, Мой друг приезжал. Мой друг приезжал в прошлом году, or whatever, right? He came to visit me last year, and now he's already departed. Let's take a prefix motion for this, uh, a good example here. Заходить зайти, meaning to duck into a store, basically. We're going to talk more about this verb later. Uh, but it's great for imperfective of canceled action. So one time I was walking along with someone and uh, we mentioned some store, that was some, some grocery store that said something like, oh, that's a good store. And I said something like, ah, я зашел туда вчера. Right? Meaning I, I ducked in there yesterday. I stopped by yesterday. Okay, end of the story. Okay, why do I get a funny look? Well, because that implies that I'm still in the store, right? So I need imperfective of canceled action. I went in and I emerged again yesterday. I should say, Я заходил в магазин. Or in this case, Я заходил туда вчера. Meaning I went in and I came out again. I canceled the action. Now, the only time you, you would use a perfective verb in that situation is if the stopping by is the first verb in a sequence, right? If you're kind of telling a little narration about, well, I stopped in the store and I bought this and I bought that and this person said this or that and you're starting some narrative, then you would use perfective, right? That's the perfective sequence. So, for example, yes, I showed my guys in, you copio up. Okay, let's do two quick uh, examples. Did someone stop by while I was gone? Okay, well, if they were there at all, they're gone now, right? So the only question that makes sense is, кто-нибудь заходил, когда меня не было? Right, canceled action. Yeah, Irina stopped by and sat for a bit. She she had some tea. I think it was a typo there. She had some tea. Um, right, or we had tea, whatever. I need to fix that. Okay, well, if the answer is yes, someone did come. Irina stopped by. Uh, well, she's gone now, so we could say Irina Irina zahadila, Irina zahadila. Okay, if we stop there, that's that's what we should say. But if we say, yeah, she dropped by and we had some tea and we chatted for a bit and 
etc. That's the sequence, right? So, and that's what we have here. Irina zashla i posidiela, etc., etc., right? We chai papili. That's the sequence. Okay, last thing to cover today is uh, verbs of beginning and ending. And this is pretty easy to cover very briefly, right? If you're using any verb in Russian, which means to start or stop doing something, and we have the three here, we've seen them already. Um, I began to do something, or I, I stopped doing something, or I finished doing something. Okay, all three of these verbs in Russian would be followed up by an infinitive, and that infinitive will always be imperfective. Okay, this, this, this is a very cut and dried rule. There are no exceptions to this. Why is this the case? I think it's pretty obvious, right? The, the aspectual choice is being made with the starting and stopping verb. Right, so if we say yesterday at three o'clock I started watching the movie, well, that would be a perfective. So you would just choose, you would say I started in the perfective um, versus I used to start work at nine o'clock, right? That would be re repetition and you would choose the imperfective for starting. Okay, so for the starting and stopping verb itself, you have a choice to make, but in the infinitive that follows, it's always imperfective because uh, you're always stopping or starting a process, right? That's so you see how logically that makes perfect sense. So, for example, anana chila raboted shest versus anana chila raboted shest, right? She began working at six. She would begin working at six. Repetition, but in all cases, the infinitive is take showing, right? It's it's in the imperfective. Okay, let's pick a few of these. We just started watching the film. Okay, this is the one a one time start. We только что начали смотреть film, right? The смотреть is imperfective. Number two, I usually begin studying around seven. Okay, present tense, that's imperfective. Я обычно начинаю. Okay, in studying, we need imperfective. Заниматься. Заниматься около семи. Number three, she would usually stop reading. Okay, so the usually, she would usually stop. That's imperfective. Она обычно переставала, or we could say заканчивала. Either, either one would work here. The main point is читать, right? The, the activity is imperfective. When will you stop talking about this? Okay, that sounds like a one time in the future, right? When will you stop talking? Когда ты перестанешь... Говорить об этом, right? Говорить, imperfective. Five, he was finishing writing his paper. Okay, he was finishing, that's imperfective. Он заканчивал писать. Он заканчивал писать. Number six, I'm already finishing up. Okay, that's present tense. So, я уже заканчиваю. Я скоро пойду. Okay, now note there, we didn't follow it up with an infinitive, right? Just the verb заканчиваю. Okay, that's enough today. So uh, that's a really important lesson. I hope that it's not too challenging. I, I find actually that I think with this approach, students have, have done quite well. I've been actually quite satisfied with it, to be quite honest, right? Uh, I think it really just necessitates us thinking a little bit and um, hopefully now seeing the aspect in a different light. And um, as long as you keep these considerations in mind, I, there's really nothing stopping you from using aspect correct, correctly, right? So start learning the verbs as aspectual pairs and always pay t attention to the context and what you're meaning to emphasize within the context and choosing aspect accordingly. Okay, anyway, a bit more on aspect on day 110, and then we'll move on with some new stuff uh, in the next chapter. Until then, uh, desvidanya.